Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today um, and uh, share some thoughts with you. So uh, we've launched Chrome. It's been about uh, 10 years since we launched. And uh, when we launched the product, we had a set of core principles that we articulated that guided our development process. And in the time since, these principles really haven't changed. And uh, as uh, Paul mentioned, as we started our collaboration with the AMP team some time ago, we realized that we shared these principles in common. And I wanted to share some of them with you as we get started today. First, speed. Speed is something that's continuously on our mind. We're constantly measuring and optimizing the performance of Chrome in service of connecting you to your users as fast as possible. And obviously, with AMP, this is a huge focus. The A in AMP stands for accelerated. We both believe that experiences that, fast, that, that uh, load really fast, that render really fast, and that re remain really responsive are the bedrock of a great customer experience. Simplicity is another one of our core values on the Chrome team. Um, we are constantly refining our user interface to make it as simple as possible, reflecting that we think a browser should just get out of the way. And uh, when we look at the, at the AMP team, we feel like this is something that we have in common, too, because AMP is all about taking the complexity of the web platform and simplifying it. And the experiences that come out of this are often really, really simple and easy to use experiences. Security is another one of these bedrock principles for the Chrome team. I think one good measurement of this is the uh, Panda Own competition that happens annually, where we invite a bunch of security researchers to come and, and try to compromise the browser. And for the second year in a row, we've emerged unscathed, which, uh, knock on wood, should I really be saying that, Stefan? But uh, we, we put a lot of effort and energy into, into this aspect of it. But it's broader than just Chrome. We think a lot about how we can push the security of the web forward as a whole. For example, we recently announced that we'll be marking all HTTP content as not secure, which we uh, said we would a little bit earlier. And we think this is really important as we push forward the entire web to HTTPS. And when you look at AMP, we think AMP's architecture also prioritizes security in many ways, such as how the AMP cache performs a validation function on content before serving it. At Chrome, we're also really big on standards. This is an area where we make substantial investment, both in our participation in standards bodies, but also our efforts to raise the entire ecosystem, such as our web platform test initiative, which is a series of integration tests that we make available to all the browser vendors, and that helps as we implement major new features, such as Service Worker. This is really important because without these efforts, there's really no great interoperability between browsers, and that's necessary for us to have an open web. And we believe that an open web is a requirement for a healthy and vibrant ecosystem for everyone. I was told this would be the only AMP plus slide in the conference. I'm sorry that, uh, that this seems to be a recurring theme. But uh, we see the two teams a huge opportunity to work together on these shared principles that we have. We want a really fast web. We want to make web development really easy. We want everything to be secure. And we want it to be consistent across platforms. And so over the past few years, as we've worked with the AMP team, we feel like the AMP effort has taught us a lot of really valuable things. And we want to work to expand the benefits of AMP to the entire web ecosystem. To explain how we're planning to do this, I'd like to invite Stefan Samaji up on stage, who's going to show you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. So my name is Stefan. I'm a product manager working at the intersection of Chromium and AMP. And as technologists, we have a tendency to deconstruct things. And so I, when I first started working on this project, one of the most helpful models from my mind was to separate AMP the format and AMP the cache, not because they're not integrated, but because they are two sides of the same coin. And they're solving problems very, in, in a very complementary fashion. I lifted the four items on the left directly from AMP project. These are not new. These are not novel. And they state very clearly what AMP is about. The result of these are that AMP pages are predictable. They're deterministic. They don't result in surprises for the users. You don't have jank. You don't have an experience 
that is inherently flawed. And a lot of this is a direct result of the optimization that happens in the case of AMP's format. By constraining the HTML that you use and by keeping things within very specific bounds, you actually result in having a much cleaner user experience. And the users thank you for it because it's a much straightforward, more straightforward set of interactions. Now, on the cache side, unsurprisingly, the AMP cache caches. It optimizes by performing transformations. It knows things that it can use to reduce the total number of bits that get pushed down to your mobile device and generally improve the experience that the user has when they're looking at an AMP page. A subtle feature of the AMP cache is the validation that it performs. It's not something that is intrinsically hugely obvious unless you've really been steeped in it, but you have a guarantee that what comes out of the AMP cache has been validated. It is unlikely to contain anything that is even remotely iffy, and that's very, very desirable. Again, it's deterministic. It's predictable. We like that. No surprises, and it's fast. So when we started thinking about our projects that overlap between AMP and the Chromium project, we decided from the very beginning that we would focus on the user benefits, because ultimately, that's what this is all about. We can talk technology. We can be incredibly impressed with the percentage of bits saved as we push them through the ether. But if the user isn't benefiting directly from the work that we do, we are doing it wrong. So we want to guarantee a consistent and a smooth web experience. Everybody wants that. And for the entirety of how long AMP has been around, it has been validated over and over and over that this is a desirable thing. The users thank us for this. Instant navigation of links. You don't want unnecessary pausing. You don't want the latency. You want stuff to happen right there and then. We know that fractions of seconds matter. We want the fluid navigation. It plays into that speed thing. It needs to feel fast. It needs to be responsive. It needs to be something that the user feels in control of. And seamless transitions are part of that as well. So it's, it's a whole package of a particularly excellent user experience. Another way that we've been thinking about it as we contemplate the technologies that will help get us there is that we want to light a path. We want to make it easiest to do the right thing and ideally prevent as many foot guns as possible. So we reduce the opportunity for error. What one group of people might consider an undue burden of a limitation, on the other hand, reduces the opportunity for creating something that isn't ideal for the user. So we reduce the opportunity for error, and this is a great benefit. This opportunity for greater user experience is also directly correlated to the speed of this experience. Everything that we do should be fast by default. We shouldn't have to spend a huge amount of time as web developers fine-tuning each and every thing. If the infrastructure, if the plumbing that you're using provides the speed by default, that's a huge win for everybody. So we want to provide all the benefits of the AMP format and continue providing them as they are today, but we want to keep evolving them. We want to allow more flexibility for developers and for publishers. So you saw the toolbox earlier from Andre. We realized some time ago that one size do not, does not necessarily fit all. Different publishers and different developers want to get to the same place via different means. And so the responsibility is on us to help provide these options. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So where are we going? One of the things that has been made exceedingly clear to us is that web origins matter. From a user perspective, they want to see in their address bar the origin of the publisher. Where is this content coming from? From a security perspective, the web origin matters as well, because you have the single origin policy that governs a great deal of the security mechanisms that are built into the web platform. All of these things come together. So we're looking into and implementing web packaging as the mechanism to allow publishers to have their web origin, their original domain, in the address bar independently of where the bits are coming from. So web packaging uh, is an author draft. Uh, you can find it on the IETF site. Um, 
At the moment, it specifies both what are called signed exchanges, which is the back and forth that allows ultimately the content to be sent off to the browser, as well as bundled exchanges, which include the resources of that exchange. What's crucially important about this is that the origin is inside the signature. By doing this, you separate attribution of your content from the delivery of the bits. You can deliver the bits through a CDN. You can deliver the bits any which way you want. But because there's a digital signature around it, you have the guarantee, the verifiable guarantee, that the bits were originally authored by the origin from whence they came. This allows you to use the most effective infrastructure to get the bits to that client endpoint, to that device that you possibly can, without having to worry about whether they were adulterated somewhere along the way, changed, things injected, who knows. But it's important that we maintain the integrity of the content, because ultimately it's that integrity that matters to the user. Now, I want to show you a quick demo of what this is going to look like. This first part is what it looks like today. So we look up Terracotta Warriors and the exhibition that's about to happen in Liverpool. We click on it, and it delivers this page. And if you look at the address bar, it says google.com slash amp. You do get the Guardian there in the subnav. It takes a, a, up a, a couple of pixels. But fundamentally, this is somewhat confusing to the user. And we've heard this feedback over and over and over. So in a web packaging world, what does this look like? We perform exactly the same query. We get the same search result. We click on it. But now, it actually provides the origin of the publisher. Now, all the real magic happened completely behind the scenes, utterly invisible to you. So that applause goes to the Tokyo team that implemented this at breakneck speed. So this is working code. Um, we have a rather finely calibrated sense of risk. We didn't want to do a live demo on stage. Uh, we look forward to this landing in Canary uh, in the not too terribly distant future. But the goal here is to have the user feel completely confident and not feel any kind of cognitive dissonance about what appears in the address bar and where this content comes from. And web packaging is how we're going to solve this. Web packaging is not a one-trick pony. There are many things that we can do with it. Uh, we think that web packaging has great potential for progressive web apps, particularly for the bundling. We also know where we are right now. We haven't optimized for performance yet. We don't want web packaging to be a performance regression. We don't want things to slow down. Now, in the video, it looked approximately the same, and that's what it is. It's approximately the same, but we want to be as fast or faster if there's any way to do it. We also understand that without debugging tools, you can't use web packaging. So we also have work to do to make sure that you can introspect web packages from within the Chrome debugging tools. So one of our responsibilities within the context of Chrome is to make sure that the debugging tools in the browser support web packages. And ultimately, we also want to make sure that there are tools out there to help you easily create web packages. You shouldn't have to hand construct them uh, painstakingly, it should just ultimately be able to be part of your content flow, whatever that might be. So another facet of the work that we've been doing between Chromium and AMP is around feature policy, uh, which is a W3C-based effort. It's a standards-based effort. And it gives developers and publishers a lot more control and enforcement and guarantees of what happens on the browser. Unlike in the strict and exclusive AMP cache model, we also want to allow a certain set of enforcement capabilities on the browser side. That, again, allows for more flexibility for how you deliver the bits. Ultimately, feature policy lets you opt in to more predictable behavior on the browser. It allows you to create the constraints, for example, to avoid unwanted reflows. Feature policy effectively is a commitment on the part of the page 
that then gets enforced by the browser to make sure that commitment is followed. Uh, one of the tools that we have on the Chrome side is called Lighthouse. I encourage you, if you're not yet aware of it, do a search in a conveniently situated search engine, look for Lighthouse, check out the power that that tool has. It will help you down this path of taking advantage of feature policy. Now, we've been looking at additional feature policies that can help us provide more amp-like experiences uh, in a browser, and this is a video of an unsized media feature policy that we recently created and that we also look forward to providing in Canary real soon now. So for the first three reloads, the policy was disabled and the hippo picture was unconstrained and it was rendered exclusively in the size that the image appeared on. And the jank was there because there was no image size provided in the image tag. Uh, and then once we enabled the policy, we absolutely enforced without an unnecessary reflow that the hippo picture rendered in the rectangle that the feature policy specified. I'm gonna run through this one more time because it wasn't strictly fair of me to just run it without explaining what was going on. Um, you can also note that these are reloads because each and every time there's a slightly different animal here in this corner. This isn't just the same picture over and over and over again. These types of feature policies where we can make up for a potential shortcoming in the specification of the page itself as it's downloaded are super helpful, super useful, and this is one of the ways that we're going to use feature policy to provide further assistance to make a more amp-like experience throughout. Now, I would be remiss, given that we spent a lot of time talking about the importance of speed, the importance of performance, well, you can't really hit performance targets if you don't measure them carefully. So having objectively defined and cleanly measurable performance goals is utterly important. One tool that is going to contribute to this overall effort of making sure we're using the right carefully calibrated yardsticks is the Chrome User Experience Report. Uh, it's available today. If you're not aware of it, that really long URL at the bottom uh, will lead you there. It is a corpus of data that we provide based on performance measurements done in the browser on Chrome for those who've opted into it. The important part of the user experience report is that it applies the same standard to all pages, regardless of the technology used to build the page. We want to have objective performance measurements so that we know what actually moves the needle and what doesn't. Uh, PageSpeed Insights is one pre-processed mechanism for displaying some of this data, but we're also making the data available as a public Google BigQuery project. So if you think of additional ways that you want to be able to query the data and view it and slice it and dice it, we make this information available to you to perform your own analysis. And it's entirely possible, even likely, that you will find more interesting ways of analyzing this and finding useful results, in which case, please share them with us, because we're very, very curious to understand what people do with this data. So this is an initial taste of where we're going, what we're doing, how we're thinking about this. The next update from us is going to be at Google I.O. in May, where hopefully we'll have a lot more stuff implemented. We will have code that you can actually play with and test with and try things out. We hope that in the meantime, though, you think about and go and read up on what are web packages, how do they work. A lot of this stuff is already documented and should already uh, be in a state that you can start thinking about the utility of all these various features. Thanks very much.